invite you to remain standing in body or spirit as you are able, as we read from God's word for us today, coming to us from Psalm 51. Let us receive these words. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. My name is Kathleen McMurray, and I am one of the pastors on staff here and have the privilege most weeks of being a part of this community here in Wesley Hall. Today, we are beginning our sermon series, Restored, uh, sorry, that's the name of my sermon for the day, Restored to Joy. We're beginning a sermon series called Living Faith, um, and we're looking each week at different aspects of our life together as a church um, that enable and empower us to live out our faith. And today we're looking um, at worship. Coming into worship, as we say every week, and as Reverend Curry reminded us, we come from many different places and spaces. Um, and as we look at our scripture for today, inviting us to consider the heart of worship, to consider as we come into this place, the power that it has for us um, and the power it has to make a difference in our world. Um, so. Again, wherever you come from, uh, in life, in faith that brings you here, um, whether you're worshiping with us in person or online, thank you for being here. Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A number of years ago, a friend of mine was going through a particularly difficult season in her life. Um, she found herself struggling with her brother's mental health, mental illness diagnosis. She found herself struggling with her mother-in-law's quickly advancing Alzheimer's. She found herself struggling with her cousin, a, a beloved cousin that had recently been sentenced to 25 years in prison for an unthinkable crime that, that she couldn't possibly imagine how he could have committed. All of this, and she was also struggling with the grief of two grandparents that she had lost in a car accident, and on top of beginning a grad program and being a brand new mom. And she just found herself completely overwhelmed. Feeling overwhelmed and alone, she reached out to me and as we were talking through things, I said, hey, I'm not trying to be all preacherly, <laughs> but I would love to invite you to church. Because for me, for my family, when we found ourselves going through seasons of struggle, it was through the support of a church that we kind of found some hope, we found some support. Um, and those were where we found our people. Um, in those really tough times, and, and she said to me, I don't think I've got it together enough to come to church. I think I'm, I'm just too broken. And I said, well, I hear that. I said, but I want you to know that I believe nobody is too broken for God. But we have this, 
this thought in our head, right? This, this thought that we have to be a certain way to come to worship. Even last week, I got an email from somebody saying, I really wanna to come to worship at your church, but I'm not sure if I have the appropriate clothes. And I said, it does not matter what clothes you are wearing. Wear some clothes and come to worship and we will be glad to have you. What we hear in Psalm 51, this act of worship, is that God yearns for us to be in worship, yearns for us to be in relationship with God, with one another, yearns for our full selves to be present, no matter how broken we are. The scripture says that this psalm was penned by David following his actions from our scripture last week following his assault on Bathsheba, his murder of her husband, Uriah, he finds himself broken, recognizing his guilt, recognizing the harm that he has done, recognizing his abuse of power, his sin, and he finds himself broken. So broken, so guilty that he can feel it in his bones he pins in the psalm. His heart, it says in three different places in the psalm, his heart is hurting. He needs renewal in his heart, the very essence of his being. He feels this deeply. And in these words, he is crying out for redemption, for mercy, crying out for the God who has delivered the people of Israel to deliver him in this moment. It's a psalm that just reads of, of desperation, of vulnerability, of a deep personal nature. It is so different from David that we read about last week, sitting in this seat of power in the palace above everyone, doling out harm from every angle. David here is broken alone, desperate for God. And so he pens this psalm, this song, a psalm that while is desperate and personal and vulnerable is also an act of worship. You see, the psalms that we have in scripture, even the ones that are very personal, have been used throughout the history of the people of God as communal acts of worship. These psalms would have been sung in the synagogues, in the temple. They have been sung by Christians over the centuries, proclaimed as acts of worship together as the people of God. So even this cry of desperation, this cry from a place of brokenness has a place in the worship and praise of God. We don't have to have it all together to come before God in order to show up and worship. In fact, our worship is most real when we recognize our need for God. Verse six of the Psalm says, you desire truth in my inmost being. God desires not some facade that we put out to the world, some facade of perfection or having it all together. God desires our truest selves, no matter how broken those selves might seem. With all the hurt and the struggle that we carry, God desires us to bring all of it to God because that is when we can truly experience the power of restoration. There's a story of Jesus on the Sabbath day going to the synagogue, going to the place of worship on the Sabbath. And as he comes into the synagogue, he encounters a man with a withered hand, a man who is in need of healing, a man who is literally physically broken. And he's on the outskirts of the synagogue, perhaps because of the limits of the law, perhaps because of his own shame that he feels, unworthiness that he feels, but on the outskirts of the synagogue is where he is and Jesus sees him. And Jesus could have healed him there. He could have healed him on the outskirts, but instead Jesus calls him in, calls him into this place of worship, into the place where God resides. He says, come. 
And it is there where the brokenness is welcome and where healing is experienced. There's this pervasive myth that I think we sometimes tell ourselves about praise and about worship, that the place of praise and joy and gladness in worship requires us to have it all together, to push aside our struggle, to put a smile on our faces even if we might be broken inside, to ignore our struggle and our sin and our brokenness in order to somehow experience or sing praise to God. But the reason that we praise is because we believe that no matter how much we struggle, no matter how broken we are, that God has the power to redeem and restore us to wholeness and to that joy and gladness that the psalmist yearns for so deeply. We praise God in worship, not because we have it all together, not because we are so good, but because God is so good, regardless of how much we have it together. And the story of worship is a story of our journey with God. It is this idea of relationship. And because it is God, it is a relationship of redemption. We, needed to be rem we need to be reminded of that. We may not have David's story. We may not have committed murder or abuse, but we do sin. All of us carry brokenness and shame. All of us live in this world that is broken, where anger can easily tear at our hearts for people that are different or people that make us mad or say things that hurt and harm the ones that we love. We live in this world where hopelessness can easily eat away at our souls and where joy and gladness can seem impossibly out of reach. And we can feel like we don't have it together enough to be around people, to approach God. But we can never be so broken that God cannot make us whole again. We can never be so far gone that we cannot be forgiven because God is a God of restoration. And the good news that we receive is that God restores us restores us from brokenness to that joy and gladness that seem impossible. Here together, as we gather as broken brothers and sisters and siblings, we gather to sing and to pray, not because life is perfect or even good, but because God is good, even when life is not. And through worship, through our songs of praise, our prayers, our cries, we can experience this resilient reminder that restoration is a reality that we believe is possible through the grace of God. And so today we participate in another reminder of the good news of God's grace. The sacrament of Holy Communion it is this place in worship where we recognize God meeting us in our most broken states as human beings, welcoming us to a table and extending and offering us new life and grace. Because as Jesus sat around the table with his disciples, knowing he was going to die, those disciples didn't have it all together. They were struggling with fear and anxiety. They were struggling with not listening to his messages and having to have him repeat himself over and over. He had people that would deny him. He had people that were in the active, that were actively involved in selling his life for money. And yet they had a place at the table. And if there is a place for them, if there is a place for David, there is always a place for you and for me at the table of God. No matter how we find ourselves, no matter how broken we are at the table, we are promised that there is a place and that through receiving the grace of God, we are restored. We can find that joy and 
gladness that seems so far gone. Not only as individuals, but as a community, we can experience restoration. We can experience wholeness and healing. We can experience justice and joy. It reminds me of the words of a beautiful modern hymn, A Place at the Table by Shirley Morgan, where she explains this promise and the power of having a place at God's table for every single person born. For every single person, no matter their life circumstances, no matter their sins, no matter their past, no matter who they are or what has done or what who has been done to them, for everyone born, there is a place at the table of God. She says, for everyone born, a place at the table. For everyone born, clean water and bread, a shelter, a space, a safe place for growing. For everyone born, a star overhead. And God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy. And she goes on throughout her verses to explain that the place at the table is for women and man. It is for young and for old. <coughs> it is for the just and the unjust. For abuser abused with needs to forgive. In anger and hurt, a mindset of mercy for just and unjust, a new way to live. For everyone born, a place at the table to live without fear and simply to be to work, to speak out, to witness and worship, for everyone born the right to be free. And God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy. There's this ripple effect. When we bring ourselves in all of our brokenness to the table of God, when we allow God to restore and redeem us, we are also allowing God then to transform us that we might be a part of restoring and redeeming the world. Now, I'm not gonna lie for a long time, I've struggled with her verse about a place at the table for those who are just and unjust, abuser and abused, those who are angry, those who are hurt. I've struggled because I, I struggle with the idea sometimes that God's grace is for everybody. In our psalm for today, I struggle some with the idea that God's grace is for David after all that he had done. But if I'm honest, I need that grace of God too. And for all to have a place at God's table makes us remember the power of God to restore us at any point in brokenness. Restore us to be people of justice and compassion, peace and joy. You, me, all of us, we may come into the presence of God broken, but we are promised that no matter how broken we are, that God does not leave us broken, but seeks to make us whole. Restoring us not just to life, but a full life of justice and joy. And that is good news indeed. Thanks be to God.